Last week, we finished off uh, chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, discussing the verses about remaining salty in the world and how we are to be uplifting like salt is to food. Losing our saltiness, that distinctive Christian identity in this world, renders us useless to Christ in spreading the Gospel. Verse 49's statement that everyone shall be salted with fire led us to conclude that Jesus was speaking about Judgment Day for both ungod for the ungodly and believers. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we will get judged on both the good and the bad that we do in this world. This isn't speaking about salvation, but it does affect our reward in the kingdom. 1 Peter 1.7 says that our faith will be tried with fire. Its effect is to remove the dross, that is, the impurities out of our system in this world. The language at the end is speaking of Christ's return and how overall Peter wants to encourage his readers to remain faithful until Jesus comes again. This is something Paul hits on quite a bit in his letters too about remaining holy and unblameable until Christ comes. Ephesians 5 7 says that the church, us, is to be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. In the grand scheme of things, nothing can be more trying to a person's faith than experience persecution for their Christian identity, and yet the call is still the same, remain salty in this world until I come. This is in essence part two to last week's talk about, but also a preview of things to come, because as we noted last week, uh, chapter 11 is just around the corner. And in terms of Jesus' timeline, uh, Palm Sunday opens up chapter 11. And so we're in the closing weeks of Jesus' ministry on earth in Mark's gospel here. And what's interesting in terms of Mark's gospel is that, as I've often said, is that, you know, he's very action-oriented. And there's not a whole lot of dialogue in there. Uh, it's more about Jesus getting from the Galilee to the cross. Yet... When you get to chapter 13 in the coming months, that entire chapter is Jesus speaking on the end times, and it is the longest recorded dialogue in the whole Gospel of Mark. Today we won't be talking about the Great Tribulation, but of tribulation in general that believers have and could experience in this world. Jesus says in John 16.33 to his disciples, that you will have tribulation, meaning that's a present thing in the world and it's just not some far distant future event. The Greek word here up at the top is uh, thalipsis for, tri for tribulation and it occurs 45 times. But the main ones that I want to highlight today for you are in Acts 14.22 that says believers must go through tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. Paul told the church at Rome to be patient in tribulation. To both the Corinthians and the Ephesians, he talks about his and their tribulation. And even to the Thessalonians in his second letter, he says that they're going through tribulation right now. The Apostle John, who opens up Revelation, says he's a companion in tribulation as he was experienced in it for his testimony of Jesus. And Jesus says that he knows the church at Smyrna's tribulation in Revelation 2.9. Smyrna wasn't the only church that got addressed. There were seven other churches, and five of them were experiencing tribulation as well. Ephesus, Pergamum, Theotira, and Philadelphia all have elements in the letters to them that speaks about how they're getting persecuted in the world. I've seen and read commentaries that kind of portray Revelation 2 and 3 as kind of like a prophetic representation or panorama of the church history. And those who hold to this often kind of see churches 4 through 7 as still in play today. Uh, the first three kind of died out as the turn of the Roman Empire turned into more of like the Catholic Church. But each uh, individually held more prevalence at a given point in time uh, throughout the last 2,000 years. Another side, though, would say that the seven letters represent the composite church picture throughout all ages, 
as elements of each of them can be found in any given time period. And each letter does include the statement, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So, since each church got a full copy of the book, is that each would have read Jesus' report card on not just themselves, but the other six that were written in the book too. I often try to think of this uh, as I'm going through that book, like, what if that happened today, where Jesus to the Church of the First Baptist of Kotzebue, Church of God, Friends Church, and like, it probably, I can't imagine that feeling that you would get with somebody else getting a copy of what Jesus addresses you as. It just like, wow, that would be probably a little uh, heart revealing. Geographically, these seven churches were relatively close to one another. And they did get a copy of each. And we do have to think that a place like uh, Colossae, uh, Book of Colossians, would have gotten word about John writing to those churches as well, uh, since they're so close to Laodicea. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians in 4.17, said to make sure that it was read in Laodicea, the letter that he wrote to them, that it should be read there too. But he also said that the Colossae Church should read the letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea as well. So there was a sharing. We don't know what Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. Uh, we don't have that. It's not in Scripture. It's never been found in archaeological digs or anything. But it also, but it does show how the process of how old uh, or not old New Testament books were being shared throughout the Mediterranean and the Near East. In that through that you know general gainings of acceptance that's how they you know were accepted as inspired scripture and eventually became the canon the other and stronger case for a universal church viewpoint is that in revelation 1 13 and 20 it talks about seven candlesticks representing the seven churches the imagery is taking is taken from the old testament and it's probably coming from Zechariah 4.2 that John was thinking of here. And these weren't seven separate candlesticks, but a menorah that would be in view with all seven held together, which in terms of the church, we are one body of Christ. So I think most can agree is that yes, these letters were specifically addressed to those seven churches. But like all scripture, is that it's not just going to them, but it's also going to us as well. Each of them have great reflective points to dwell on and for us to see where each of us individually might currently line up with. You know, maybe you're feeling a little more Theotira in you at the time, or hopefully not Laodicea as that's the apostate church. But it does provide us with warning shots to try to, try to prevent us from veering off and resembling the middle part of Jesus' compliment sandwich here. Now, even though a person or even a whole church could be reflecting Sardis or Laodicea that has nothing good to say about them, is that at the end of it all, is that paradise with God is still on the table for everyone. But when contemplating about the seven letters, have you ever thought about when Jesus says to each of them, the call to overcome? Namely, what is he telling them to overcome? Tribulation, persecution, temptation, evil. So basically, in a nutshell, the message is, don't give up, don't walk away from the faith. And since many of them were likely first or second generational Christians who probably left paganism behind, is that daily pressure from their friends, family, and, and scrutiny from just in general their neighbors and everybody else around them is something that probably would have really intensified in their heart and mind over a course of time. But that type of persecution didn't end in the first century. Christian persecution continued throughout the time of the Roman Empire. The highest point would be what is called the Great Persecution pe uh, Period at the end of the first uh, end of the third century, with the Emperor Diocletian stripping Christians of all legal rights, 
forced them to sacrifice to pagan gods and to renounce Christ. But if the believer refused to renounce, they were arrested, tortured, potentially put to death, with a lot of them being used as the entertainment in the Colosseum. Has anybody ever gone to Rome and seen, been at the Colosseum before? As you walk in through the main entrance, there's a cross there that was dedicated by, I can't remember, I think it might have been Pope John II. But to commemorate all the deaths of Christians that took place in the Colosseum. Fast forward to the 20th century. There's a whole lot of persecution you can read about uh, between those centuries. Soviet Russia began widespread persecution of, of outspoken Christians. Wikipedia's page on this gives a great overview of how Lenin, uh, Joseph uh, Lenin, right from the onset, aimed to dismantle religion throughout the nation. The state never actually outlawed religion, but its policies from the very beginning prohibited religion in any facet, being taught in public schools or even private schools. This showed clearly the Communist Party's aim and intent. Some church leaders resisted, though, during this. The Communist, Communist Party didn't back down, though, and began to imprison believers for speaking out and force them into labor camps, including torturing them with the hopes of them to renounce Christ. If you can get the pastors and the leaders to renounce, the lay will go as well. The most notable example during this is Richard Wurmbrand's 14 years in prison, uh, tortured for Christ. Probably heard of, uh, uh, what is it, Voice of the Martyrs is the main uh, organization over this. He was uh, just brutally tortured and others that were in prison in these uh, camps. Uh, I think there might be some information in the back there. There's a, a free movie you can uh, watch on their website. And even throughout those uh, gruesome, torturous uh, periods, Wormbrand never felt any closer to God. He even prayed to go back into prison. He was released one time, and he could feel that sense of closeness with God drifting away a little bit. And he prayed, Lord, put me back in. I have more work there to do, and that's where my relationship with you is never better. He did go back and finished off his 14 years, eventually came to America. And this still goes on today, this type of torture, especially those in the Middle East and Eastern countries. Even though in such intense pressure has and is and will happen to believers, is that Christ's charge is still the same. Endure to the end. Revelation 5.8 informs us that even though we might be experiencing persecution, is that God is still hearing our prayers throughout all of it. Now, we might not feel if we're going through this that, hey, is he hearing me up there? Is anything getting answered? Well, yes. Maybe not in the timely manner that we would like, like now, <laughs> please get me out of this. But I think that the older that you get, the more you look back, you're probably thinking and thanking God more often for not giving you exactly what you wanted right away. But for these seven churches in Revelation is that they were receiving a lot of pressure and some of them intense persecution, including by the Roman government. On the earthly side is that you can see that these five, you know, were getting afflicted in various ways. And Jesus still com uh, commended the ones that had to put up with it quite a bit. But it still then begs the question of, on the screen here, what about Sardis and Laodicea? Why did they have nothing uh, being persecuted on them? Well, I think the answer is found in what Jesus said in John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you as well. So there's a, our promise. The more we resemble Christ in this world, the more persecution that we will receive in return. I'm sure some of you probably know who Tim Tebow is, famous football player, 
The man couldn't have been more outspoken for Jesus on the field, actively praying during games, saying, you know, the gospel and such. And endless heat from the media was just thrown on him. The man now runs uh, the Tim Tebow Foundation, which is mainly done to help uh, uh, sex trafficking and sex trafficking throughout the world. He's gone before Congress. And before he, you know, got to speak, there's a few congressmen and ladies that just felt it was a good chance to just rip into him, you know, kind of make fun of him because he's went from football to try baseball and then he tried to make a comeback in football. And, you know, the guy loves sports. He tried to do it, you know, but let's make fun of him, you know, for his quote unquote failures. He just laughs throughout it. Oh, yeah, you know, and, you know, just takes it like a champ, but he, he resembles what we're supposed to do and remain salty in front of the world. By a show of hands, anyone has seen this correlation play out in your own life, where the more you're trying to witness, the more heat you're getting in return. The thermometer can go up, but it means that it also can go down as well. Now, although we are visible, that we only visibly see the persecution coming from fellow people here on earth, is that we also need to remember that we are also contending with the main spiritual en enemy of God behind the scenes in this. Ephesians 6.12 is the most explicit verse saying that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the evil spiritual forces that are behind the scenes. It's pretty hard to keep this perspective in mind as you're dealing with someone right in front of you who's being confrontational with you, but it's one that you just kind of have to marinate on a little bit just to remember they don't have the spirit in them. I do. They have a hole in their heart. I'm filled. We have to just continue to represent regardless at the end of the day. So when the seven churches read the description of John being brought before the throne in Revelation 4.2, is that this would have offered them some comfort because God on the throne means what? Control. He's in control. He's ruling. He will handle it at the end of the day. And this is the reason why this scene informs us that God does have a plan and a day where he'll say enough is enough. And that evil will no longer be allowed in either the physical world or in the spiritual world. It's just like the flood. At a point, there's a point of no return. That's it. This dual judgment event is seen taking place in Revelation 20, before the great white throne room, where the books, plural books, are open for the ungodly, probably with everything that they've ever done in this world, whereas the righteous are listed in the one book of life. This event is what is the what the disciples knew what Jesus was referring to when he said, everyone shall be salted with fire. As said earlier, is that when you get to chapter 13, it's all about Jesus discussing the end times. A helpful helpful preview to that chapter, because it's it's a quite a bit of material to wrestle with is, and it also helps with today's topic, is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And that's in Matthew 13. And it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a person who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed darnel among the wheat and went away. When the plants sprouted and produced grain, then the darnel also appeared. So the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the darnel come from? He said, An enemy has done this. So the slaves replied, Do you want us to go and gather it? But he said, No, since in gathering the darnel you may uproot the wheat along with it. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first collect the darnel and tie it in bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat into my barn. Now, <clears throat> why the sower told his slaves not to pull the darnel weed out of the field is because darnel weed is so similar looking to regular wheat. 
and that the average person uh, looking down at, at it all would not be able to tell the difference between the two, in which in that case you probably would accidentally pull up some of the real stuff and not just the fake. So to prevent the workers from accidentally taking out some of the real stuff in the process is that the sower said it's better to leave the false poisonous weed in the field until harvest time. Now, if you're still a little confused by what is Jesus talking about all here, well, thankfully, he just gave us the clear interpretation following up these verses. Then Jesus left the crowds and went to his house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the darnel in the field. Then Jesus answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of Man. The field is the world and the good seed are the people of the kingdom. The poisonous weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. As the poisonous weeds are collected and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, he will send out his angels, and they will gather from his kingdom everything that causes sin as well as all lawbreakers. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The one who has ears had better listen. That last line would be very familiar to any person who's gone through Revelation because it appears in every single one of the letters to them. So Jesus informed the apostles and us is that no matter how much we probably want evil just to stop, <laughs> whether it be in the immediate context or in the broad, is that it's going to last until he comes back. So that means this is not going to be, we're not going to make the world the best place ever. <laughs> it's not going to be where we have our best life now. That's in the, going to be in the kingdom. So for the past two weeks, just in these two little verses, we've seen how much is contained within verse 49 and 50. Individually and collectively, we know that we need to remain salty regardless. During the Holocaust, many of, the, many of faith helped hide Jews from the Nazis. None more famous than Corrie ten Boom. After World War II, she became a, a, a writer and I particularly like uh, her poem, uh, the, the Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly. Will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why? The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Growing up, um, well, probably even till I was 30, um, I think it was probably kind of hard to imagine a World War II thing taking place again. The Holocaust, I think for probably all of us who studied history going through school, it's probably one of the worst events in human history ever. Yet, you start looking at the world around us today with the tensions that are going on. We know there's war between UK, Ukraine and Russia and Europe and U.S. is, you know, involved in that. Uh, you got the tension between Israel and Gaza. China and Taiwan is always seems to be on the on the verge as well. Basically, you got all the superpowers and the biggest uh, players in the world all right at the line with each other. And so, you know, it's very likely that something will happen again at some point. It just takes one spark to just ignite the whole thing like the first two world wars did as well. Now, 
regardless of that, though, we have to remain with our Christian identity in front of everybody and have to mentally and soulfully be ready for anything that could come. In America, I think we live in a more cushioned environment, whereas many parts of the rest of the world, we would these, we, these words would hit us a lot harder because we would be experiencing it more often. But you never know how the things might just turn, even in America. Christians, in terms of population identifying as Christians, is just plummeting off decade after decade. I think if we go to probably back to our home churches, wherever they might be, it's probably looking pretty thin in there. And that's happening in more places too. So we never know how America might flip itself. Israel went up and down many times, and you never know if America might flip and not become a majority of Christians identifying in the nation anymore. But at the end of the day, who wins? God does. Corey threw out all of that, or Corey Ten Boom. She said, don't be afraid. Just read the last pages of the Bible. Jesus is the victor. In the end, he wins. And since he wins, we win. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at justscripture.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.